Please like and subscribe to this channel and press the bell icon to get new video updates. Hiram Sibley and other Rochester businessmen formed the New York and Mississippi Valley Printing Telegraph in, in 1851. As there was already a Morse franchise line through Rochester, they had to use a competing telegraph technology, the house printer. This was an early teleprinter, which actually worked, at least on good days. The Morse interests made money by selling exclusive franchises to independent telegraph companies to use the Morse patent over some specific route or in some specific territory. Once Morse had shown that his system worked, it became the next big get rich quick scheme, kind of like the dot com craze of the 1990s. Sibley and friends, instead of building yet another money losing telegraph company, went about acquiring bankrupt and poor performing regional telegraph companies and stitched them together. Along the way, Sibley acquired the rights to use the Morse patents and the house printer was dropped. On the right, Ezra Cornell had been contracted to design the plow, used to dig the trench, install the cable, then cover it up for Morse's demonstration line between Washington and Baltimore. However, the insulation of this line, and there were other reasons it probably would not have worked, proved flawed. Further, when they had already spent much of the $30,000 Congress had allocated for this effort, Cornell contrived a, to seriously break his plow in a manner that would not arouse suspicion, thus stopping the work so the Morse pet partners could come up with a better way. Of course, this was open wire pole line. Cornell then also went into the telegraph business and became a bitter rival of the Sibley interests. But as most, of small, most small telegraph companies were losing money at the time, they eventually put their differences aside and merged. Supposedly, it is Cornell who insisted on the name Western Union for the combined companies as part of the merger deal. Of all the early players in the telegraph industry, including Morse, Cornell by far made the most money from his involvement. Cornell University was originally built with his telegraph profits. Just for interest, uh, Sibley, as well as a number of other well-known telegraph pioneers, including James Reed and Henry O'Reilly, are buried here in, at, in Rochester at Mount Hope Cemetery. This is a picture of his actual headstone, and this is the marker for the gravesite for him and his wife. Although we're talking the Morse Telegraph, I would be remiss if I didn't mention telegraph messengers. Before the widespread use of private telephones, telegrams were delivered by messengers. Most of these were young men, boys really, although there was the occasional girl messenger. In cities, they got around by riding on bicycles and Western Union had a standard bicycle design as shown. These bicycles are now of course collectibles. Not only would they deliver telegrams, but they would perform other messenger services as well. It became well known that telegraph messengers, although generally quite young, knew their way around. The telegraph was used by many businesses, some not entirely above board, and that the young boys were exposed to this underworld became an issue for early child labor activists. In fact, smart boys in big port cities took advantage of this knowledge. When the Navy hit town, the sailors knew to ask the messengers where they could have some fun. The boys, as a result, would get tips from the sailors, as well as the bordellos and women to whom they brought business. If you had sufficient telegraph business, Western Union would install a call box at your location. To send a telegram, all you had to do was write it out and then twist the knob on your call box and a messenger would be dispatched to your location. They worked much like the old neighborhood fire alarm call boxes. These call boxes were once ubiquitous. There was a film made in the late 1950s titled Some Like It Hot, which starred Jack Lemmon, Tony Curtis, Marilyn Monroe, and others, and staged in the late 1920s or early 1930s. The boys, musicians, 
are in, are, are in a booking agent's office early in the film, and next to the secretary's desk on the wall is a Western Union call box, like the one shown above in the middle. The set dresser put it there, even though it played absolutely no role whatsoever in the movie, because it would have been there. A booking agent would have been a heavy user of the telegraph. The box has just sent a digit code, not Morse code. In the early 50s, my parents were still getting telegrams delivered by messenger here in Rochester, but because we lived in the suburbs, the messenger was a man driving a car. However, a visitor to the AWA Museum several years ago told me that as a young man, he had been a Western Union bicycle messenger in the early 50s here in Rochester. By the middle 50s, this more or less ended, and as one author of a book on messenger service wrote, Clearly, a telegram was no longer an affordable luxury, no longer a special event, and no longer an occasion for a brave and bold messenger to track you down in the midst of your busy day and hand you an urgent communication with a smile. Like any company, Western Union advertised. The ad on the left describes the efficiency of sending a telegram when compared to using the telephone. This was particularly true back when long distance telephone service was expensive and the telegraph was not. The ad on the right, obviously not politically correct in today's world, is pointing out a problem that Western Union had. The telegraph is used mostly by business. Individuals used, usually only used it for emergencies, mother ill, come quick, or father passed, funeral Tuesday, can you make it? One former MTC member was a small town telegraph operator. He was walking up the front steps of a house to deliver a book telegram, which was an early form of advertising spam. He heard a shriek of terror from the house. It's the telegraph operator. The public believed telegrams brought bad news. This ad was one way for Western Union to encourage individuals to send congratulatory telegrams to increase the use of the telegraph and of course, improve their bottom line. Another approach they took was to print up special occasion forms for New Year's, Christmas, and others. Further, although you can write your own sentiments, the sender form on the left has a series of canned sentiments for those with writer's block, just like inside most greeting cards today. The, just check the box you want, and that would be the message sent. The receiver would get the message printed on the form on the right. I also have a three-year Western Union pocket calendar in the form of a little book for the years 1949, 50, and 51. For each month, it has a series of canned cents, typical of that month, printed along with the month's calendar. The back page of this little book has the saying, why are the good news? Nothing gives the thrill of a telegram. The press was a heavy user of the telegraph. As I said in the previous, uh, the, early, the part one of this talk, uh, the Telegraph put the new in news like nothing before or since. And this was especially true reporting events in real time. These images were taken at a World Series baseball game at the Polo Grounds in New York City in the early 19 teens and show Telegraph operators sending play-by-play -play reports. These telegraph reports would mostly go to newspapers. Note that the two operators in the back row nearest the photographer are using Barclay box relays. Here's a close up of a Barclay box relay in my collection. Barclay replaced the wooden box, which by that time had become a popular form of sounding relays for over 30 years. And we had an image of it in part one with a shallow metal box with a wooden drum head on which the relay contacts are mounted. It was thought to make a clearer, more distinct sound, although having both kinds, I frankly don't think so. In the simplest sense, the newspapers would put out a special edition of their paper called a baseball extra immediately after the end of the game. They also might post the scores inning by inning on their front windows or for important games, mechanical scoreboards were employed. These took many forms from simple to quite complex. Not only newspapers, but maybe a group of local tavern owners would rent one of these scoreboards as it would gather a crowd and they could sell more beer. Another possibility, 
is one could watch the game inside in a theater, paying an admission to enter. These two images show the audience view and the behind the scenes view of a patented system from the early 1920s. The telegraph operator is the one seated at the typewriter with a sounder and resonator beside him. The image on the right, not all that clear, I took it out of a very old magazine, shows the during the game assembly from the telegraph reports of the game. So that could be quickly released by the newspaper as the baseball extra on game completion. You see the telegrapher at his typewriter and his sounder calling out the plays. Next to him is the man keeping the box score. You see the linotype operator behind him and, and in the back, the layout men putting the uh, cast lines of type into the chase as the game plays out. By the end of the game, the form would be complete so the stereotype plates could be quickly cast and the presses could be rolling in under 15 minutes. The image on the left shows Western Union press service manager, Harry White, also at the polo grounds, likely now in the 1940s, using one style of a Western Union portable press set to send what was called paragraph one, a Western Union play-by-play -play service developed in the early 1930s for use for radio recreation. The term paragraph one refers to the fact that it was the first paragraph in the FCC tariff which authorized this radio service. I have not been able so far to find a copy of this tariff. I have a couple of these portable sets in my collection and actively use them on our internet telegraph wires. Along with the following slide, which features well-known baseball broadcaster, Red Barber is an audio recording made in the early 1980s of interviews with Red and others who did this, including former US President Ronald Reagan. The audio clip is about seven and a half minutes long. This is Kevin Harlan live on KCMO Kansas City, the sports giant of the Midwest, and you folks are in for a real treat right now. In these days and times, baseball fans are inclined to take play-by-play -play for granted, and instant replays is just another electronic expectation. They get extremely bored at the slightest interruption. Well, broadcasting, of course, is not always this sophisticated, and this next feature is a bit of nostalgia on the early days of baseball broadcasting, back in the days when we moved at a much slower pace, and when we had only eight teams in each league, and Major League Baseball reached only as far as St. Louis. It kind of salutes a different type of communicator, unique in his time, who brought the nation the news of its baseball heroes, almost to the instant. Here's Bill Davis. Morse Telegraph, the original electronic communication. Here it's identifying Western Union Paragraph 1, a baseball wire service provided by the telegraph company during the 1930s and 40s. That was in 34. I had been with Western Union since 22 at age uh, 12 years. When I went to Western Union, I was 20 years old because it was 1922, and I, I was working as a Morse code telegrapher. 82-year-old Harry Mormon of Cincinnati former Western Union telegraph operator assigned to Paragraph 1 service. They, there were three stations where we decided to put the game on together. They were in competition. But uh, it wasn't before the year was up. It's all uh, the other two stations dropped out. It was only WSAI. WSAI Radio, Cincinnati, owned by Powell Crosley, who was also owner of the Cincinnati Reds. Crosley hired Red Barber to recreate the Reds play-by-play. -play, the beginning of a fabulous career for Red Barber. Uh, I came uh, to uh, the big leagues in, in 1934, Cincinnati, and I was five years there, uh, 15 at Ebbets Field in Brooklyn, and then 13 more at Yankee Stadium. And that may, for uh, the benefit of our listeners, say that uh, all of the broadcasts of out-of-town games were done from Western Union recreations until 1946. Uh, this may surprise some people. When the Major Leagues first granted permission for this in 1934, Barber says Morse Telegraph became an important part of baseball broadcasting. Western Union had an exclusive. And in those days, each Major League ballpark had a sending operator. That was his specialty, to send Paragraph 1. And uh, we, we used to get that very, very accurate report. Harry Mormon became Barber's telegrapher at WSAI. Mormon was, was a wonderful operator. And after a while, uh, we became such a team that uh, if all of a sudden he'd start uh, breaking and asking for... He would know in advance 
uh, what I needed. And if, if I needed something extra, he'd already be, uh, be requesting it before. And Red describes the coordination between announcer and telegrapher. And the way we did it with Harry Mormon, uh, sitting in the studio, uh, he would uh, sit to his typewriter and would have, have his bug right alongside of it. And I would be uh, looking over his right shoulder at what he wrote on the typewriter. And he would translate uh, the dots and dashes into uh, consonants and vowels. Some announcers applied sound effects to the recreated games. Veteran Detroit Tiger broadcaster Ernie Harwell. I didn't use any crowd noise. I had a ruler, and I would hit the table as to simulate the crack of the bat, but that would be about all I would use. Now, later on, fellows like Gordon McClendon, who did the Liberty Network, they had a very elaborate setup. They'd have a crowd noise, and they'd have a vendor downstairs yelling out the peanuts and popcorn, and they'd have a PA come over. Harwell inserted another popular sound device. I, I followed the fellow that had uh, done the games on recreation, and the fans there were used to a a gong when a man singled. You hit it like the NBC chimes. You'd hit it one time, a double, you'd hit it twice, triple, three, home run, four. And people were used to that, and it sounded a little bit corny as you look back, but it was a device to attract attention. And Red Barber says he didn't go for phony sound effects. He preferred to keep things simple. As I say, I understood and, uh, that a lot of fellas uh, wanted to make that... Uh, Western Union recreation sounded as though it were a live, viable broadcast. Well, my reaction was just the opposite. I wanted the audience to know at all times that I was doing a recreation, separate and apart from when I was doing a live game. Uh, and I uh, didn't have any sound effects uh, added in except the actual sound effect of uh, the operator's typewriter and the Morse code, the dot and the dashes. Speaking of dots and dashes, the signals were condensed as much as possible. For example, SC1 stood for strike one call. PTF, pitcher throws to first. NTG AX, sent at the end of an inning for nothing across. No runs, no hits, no errors, none left. According to Ernie Harwell, amusing situations sometimes developed when the telegraph signals were heard ahead of the announcer's dialogue. That didn't bother us, although there were always stories about guys sitting in the bars, you know, who knew the Morse code, and, and they would place a bet that Joe Jones was going to hit a home run because they'd heard it on the Morse code maybe a half an inning ahead. In 1946, the Yankees sent Mel Allen on the road to broadcast live. The beginning of the end for paragraph one. But until that time, most of the country depended on Morse Telegraph for its Major League Baseball. Chicago Cub fans in Iowa tuned in on WHO Des Moines and listened to Cub games recreated by sports director Ronald Reagan. Curly Waddell was the operator, sat on that side, and, uh, and he would type and slip it under the window to me. And we were within a half a pitch of right up with the live ball game all the time. To do that, he had to abbreviate things down. Like, in would come the paper and it would say, out, four, three. Well, that meant out from second base to first base. That meant it had to be a grounder. So you'd take it and you'd say, and Dean comes out of the wind-up and here comes the pitch and it's a hard-hit ground ball down towards second base. So-and-so going over after the ball picks it up, puts it over to first just in time for the out. And now Red Barber offers a final salute to that rare breed of baseball communicator, the old-time press box telegrapher. Anytime I ever needed an elaboration on a play, uh, I always got it. And, uh, uh, and I found out uh, afterwards that their reports that they said were always extremely accurate. And I owe a great deal of what success I had in those years uh, to the cooperation and the ability of, of the West Union operators. They, they, were, they, were, they were sharp fellas. They could do it. Although by the early 1930s, teleprinter technology, particularly that made by Teletype Corporation, had pretty much replaced telegraphers for the distribution of news to the newspapers by the Associated Press and others. News gathering still made heavy use of the, early, uh, the easily portable telegraph equipment, which could be quickly set up and was rugged enough to go on the road. On the left is a photo of the press setup for an October 29, 1936 speech by President Franklin Roosevelt from the steps of the Capitol building in Harrisburg, PA. 
The telegraph sets shown were called special event sets, or secret sounders, as they made the clicking sound of the telegraph sounder in a headset so as not to interfere with the audience hearing of the speech. The photo, the, the photo was made by telegrapher Arthur Grumbrine, an MTC member now passed away, whose position can be seen in the lower right. I have one of these sets in working condition. On the right is the press setup for reporting on the 1944 trial of Thomas Lonergan, a self-described playboy and his beautiful 22-year-old wife, Patricia Burton, who was the heiress to the Burton Bernheimer beer fortune, which was said to be about $7 million. They had been living the wildlife drinking and carousing in nightclubs until dawn and known for scandalous sexual behavior. He murdered her in her bedroom with a silver candlestick. To me, this sounds a little like the board game Clue. Anyway, because of the fortune and their behaviors, there was worldwide interest in the trial. Reporters and telegraphers are shown reporting on the trial. They're using a different style of Western Union portable press set. I also have one of these, which we use regularly on our internet wires. The last reported use of manual Morse telegraphy for news gathering was at Barry Goldwater's nominating convention in 1964 in California. We're now going to look at railroad use of the telegraph. This talk was originally put together for a presentation to the Honeyoy Falls Historical Society. So the left image shows the Honeyoy Falls station on what was called the peanut line of the New York Central, probably around 1910. What has always amused me about this photo is that the, th of the three women and two men have climbed up the order board semaphore for mast for unknown reasons. The order board was a special type of signal indicating to an approaching train from either direction, and thus the two semaphore arms, that the station agent had telegraphic train orders for him and whether the train should stop for a Form 31 order or that they could pick up a Form 19 on the fly. Those digit codes are from what is called the Western Union 92 code. If you are an amateur radio operator, you are probably familiar with the sub code 73 and maybe 88, which also come out of the 92 code. That said, this code could never really be called a standard as there were different dialects of it, but it was widely used. The right image is also said to be of a very early photo of the peanut station in Honeyoy Falls. Based on the engine shown, it certainly is an earlier photo. It does not mention the railroad, but it is likely the peanut as the other, the Lehigh Valley, didn't arrive in Honeyoy Falls until the 1890s when engines would have been a more modern design than the one shown. The woman shown is said to be the agent telegrapher, but I, I do know the names of some of the early agents there and there is no women listed among them. This slide is just some images of railroad telegraph installations. On the upper left is F.S. Tower on the Erie Railroad in Elmira, New York, about 1936. I like they have all the various mainline sounders in these little cubby holes. The upper right photo is an image of Ken Rice in the station at Freeville, New York on the Lehigh Valley Railroad in 1958. He appears to be sending a telegram. On the lower left is P.O. Tower in Porter, Indiana on the New York Central around 1950. On the lower right is a nickel plate railroad installation in an unknown location in May 1975. The last known railroad use of the telegraph in the U.S. for business purposes was in 1982 in Montana on the Burlington Northern, but it was apparently still in use by the railroads in Mexico at least into the late 1980s. And I know there were working, railroad, working wires up along railroads in the US up to around 1990, uh, used by the old heads to chat. It was really the falling of all the pole line that signaled the end of the telegraph. Although railroads ran by a schedule called a timetable, we all know what happens to schedules. The telegraph allowed the collection of information about up-to-date train movement by a dispatcher who could then change the schedule to keep the railroad fluid by sending out what were called telegraphic train orders to the stations ahead of the train, because there's no direct communication with the train. The upper photos show operators delivering Form 19 train orders on the fly. 
On the right, the operator is using the classic order hoop. You can kind of sort of see, it's not all that clear. And, the, and, and then on the left, an order fork. The order fork was designed by a tower operator in Freeport, Illinois in the late 1920s and called the high-speed delivery fork. I have one of these forks. Train orders and clearance cards would be attached to the hoop or fork and delivered to the train on the fly. The hoops were taken by the trainmen, and after the orders removed, the hoops would be thrown off the train, hopefully near the station, as the operator had to retrieve them. The advantage of the fork was that the orders were tied into a loop of string on the fork, and the trainman just took the loop of string, not the fork, so the operator did not have to, anything to retrieve, not fun in rain and wind or cold and snow. The lower left image is an advertisement for the high-speed delivery fork. The lower right cover shows a cover of, from Railroad Stories magazine showing a woman operator hooping up orders complete with her sleeve guards to keep her white blouse clean. Sleeve guards were popular with both men and women who did clerical work as white shirts would quickly get soiled. You can see this guy up here has got sleeve guards on too. It's now time for a little fun. Sex is always a popular topic, and here we have two such images. The one on the right shows the picking up of Form 19 orders along with the women operator. The artist easily did a number of such telegraphic cartoons. If it says, no, no, just the train order, not the operator. The cover image on the left shows a natty operator and an appreciative young lady fawning over him. This actually happened and in fact was quite common. Some operators were known to take advantage of this. To become a railroad operator, you usually had to cub the job at no pay until the agent for whom you were cubbing was satisfied that you could make the grade. You would then be tested by the chief dispatcher on your knowledge of the rules and your skill as a telegraph operator. If you passed, you would be put on the extra board, meaning that you were available for work should any come up. Such new operators would find themselves being sent all around the division to cover for others, sick or on vacation, or when there was a traffic rush somewhere. However, there was no guarantee of employment or pay otherwise. Eventually, with building seniority, you hoped you would be able to hold down a steady job. The image looks like mostly an advantage for the young man, as of course most but not all such operators were young men. But we also must consider the situation from the young woman's point of view. If you were a young woman in small town America back in Lake Victorian times, your actions were somewhat prescribed by custom. Your freedoms were limited and you were likely expected to remain with your parents until suitably married. It is also likely that you were aware, well aware, of the talents, or lack thereof, of the local population of marriageable young men. So when this new operator, likely of late teen or early 20s age, shows up, he was, in simple terms, fresh meat. Certainly you were going to check him out. And again, operators of that era have reported that such checkouts were common. Further, in what was an agrarian economy with only seasonal and sometimes absent income, this guy had a regular payday and was working at what was a respected job. Finally, if you were tired of living in your boring little town, this guy, being he was new, was likely going to be moved around a bit, and so it might be your ticket out. But there were occasions where young women were taken advantage of. One young man, Herbert Pease, wrote a book, Singing Rails, about his experiences working for the railroad at the dawn of the 20th century. He passes the tests and is riding a train home afterwards, wondering how long it will be before he lands any kind of even temporary position. He is surprised when upon arriving home, there is a telegram waiting for him, ordering him to immediately proceed to some station and take over the night trick. He catches the next train, arriving little after the night trick would have started. The day agent, disgusted at having to work late, just throws in the keys and leaves, not explaining anything about where things were. While wondering what he has gotten himself into, he hears a sudden commotion at the door of the depot. An obviously inebriated young man busts in and asks for the night operator. When Pease identifies himself as such, the young man pulls out a gun and takes a shot at him. To make a long story short, the reason Pease got the sudden posting was because the previous night operator had gotten a local girl in, as they used to say, a family way, and upon learning this, it skipped town. The young man was the girl's brother out for revenge against the night operator, except he got the wrong one. Fortunately, the gunshot missed, else I wouldn't have been reading Pease's autobiography. 
I like to say that P started his railroad career, career with a bang. Much more recently than reading this book, I learned that Pease had been a member of the Morse Telegraph Club, and in fact, one of its early historians. How did people go about becoming telegraph operators? As described above, one could cub the job, sweeping out the station, blocking the stove, cleaning the toilets, and other such mundane tasks for the agent, usually at no pay, in turn for him teaching you telegraphy and station business. This was much more typically done by young men as hanging around a railroad station was considered rather unseemly for young women. After all, that's how traveling salesmen came into town and they too were famous for getting local young women in trouble. If either of your parents were telegraph operators and you were interested, you could learn the skill from them. I mentioned in the first half of the talk, the Canadian woman who is the MTC's immediate past president. She grew up living in a railroad station and learned the skill from her father. A letter to the editor in an early 1940s issue of Railroad Magazine described a man and woman, both telegraph op operators, who met and married working in the large Western Union office in New York City. Naturally, they started having children, but decided that New York City was not a good environment in which to raise them. So they moved out to Montana and took over a railroad station. When it was all said and done, they had 11 children, as even as you can achieve with 11, both boys and girls. According to the writer, one of the male children, by the age 16, each and every one of the children had a paying job as a telegraph operator. Telegraphy was in some ways a family business. As the slide shows, there were also telegraph schools, some well-respected and some fly by night, who would take your money and then disappear. There were also a number of mail order textbooks you could buy for self-instruction. Again, some good, some not so good. The Dodge School was one of the very well-respected ones and also published a textbook you could mail order. There were several, seven editions of the book published in the late 1890s to 1921. I have about half of the editions, and at least one of them can be found downloadable. As they were quite popular, hard copies, both originals and reprints, can also be easily acquired. Because of the demand, clerical schools frequently added telegraphy to the courses they offered. I interviewed the president of the then Rochester Business Institute about a dozen years ago by tel telephone, and their records showed that they had once taught telegraphy. If there was a shortage of operators, I know railroads would occasionally set up temporary schools until the shortage was addressed. This is probably an unnecessary image for this group, shown as a Lionel J36 bug. If you pound brass, as it was said, after a while, you might develop what today we call a carpal tunnel syndrome, although it was called telegrapher's paralysis or glass arm back in the day. Herb Pease had to quit his telegraph job as a result of developing it. Another telegrapher, Horace Martin, after several failed efforts, developed what he called the Vibroplex, a semi-automatic telegraph transmitter, which employed a side-to-side -side motion and made the dots automatically. It eventually picked up the nickname Bug and essentially became an overnight sensation within a telegraph fraternity. In the 1920s, they developed a design they called the number six or lightning bug. Pictured is a copy of a Vibroplex lightning bug made by a Lionel Corporation, the toy train folks, for World War II use. As the quality of telegraph lines improved, they would work with less sensitive instruments than mainline relays or sounding relays, and this led to the development of mainline sounders, which could also be used without local, a local circuit. Four popular 20th century designs are shown. You've probably heard of singing telegrams. A man named George Oslin published a book titled The Story of Telecommunications in 1992. Oslin was 92 years old at the time he wrote the book and was the one who developed the singing telegram as an advertising gimmick while working for Western Union in the late 1920s. He had a woman Western Union operator phone movie star Rudy Valley on his birthday and sing him happy birthday. This was reported in the trade press variety, and the story was picked up by other newspapers. Pretty soon, Western Union was being inundated with requests for singing telegrams. Western Union management was not pleased at George's action until it was pointed out to them that the service was significantly increasing the non-business use of the telegraph. That said, only those employed by Western Union were asked to do this, 
not the poor old railroad operator pictured on this 1940 Saturday evening post cover on the right. And given that he's using his scissors phone, he could only be singing to the dispatcher or another agent telegrapher on the line. The last slide shows me and the AWA telegraph office on Morse Day in 2017. The MTC celebrates Morse's birthday annually on the last Saturday in April. He was born on April 27th. This photo was taken shortly after the office first became operational. If you're in the area, please stop in and visit the museum. And if you want, you can even sit at the desk and practice your American Morse code. The desk can simultaneously be connected to two of the MTC's internet-based simulated waywires, a virtual pole line, as I like to call it. I would be remiss now if I didn't talk a bit about the Morse Telegraph Club. It was originally founded in California in 1942 as a non-industry specific fraternal order of working and retired landline telegraphers. Over the years, it has morphed into a living history organization. We celebrate the use of the original Morse code now called American Morse. Anyone with an interest in American Morse is welcome and even encouraged to join and you no longer have to take a wire test. No telegraphic skill is required. It is currently a 501c3 corporation incorporated in Illinois so your tax deductible donations would be welcomed. The club presently has between four and 500 members, mostly in the US and Canada, as landline telegraphy in North America always used American Morse. But we do have some foreign members as well. This is the main page of the uh, Morse Telegraph Club's website. Membership is $20 a year. And with that membership, you get our quarterly magazine dots and dashes but you do not have to be a member to browse the website with its many links. The current issue of Dots and Dashes can be viewed on the site. I think, uh, yeah. And you can actually download it. Anyway. The club's goal is to preserve the history art, science, practice, memory, and lore of the North American closed circuit landline telegraph system. In addition to publishing dots and dashes, we do this by giving talks like I'm doing tonight, assisting with the establishment of museum displays, and also by setting up temporary displays at various venues. We have even helped movie producers, including Steven Spielberg, correctly re represent the telegraph in their films. We would welcome you to join us in this effort. As icing on the cake, for the last 15 years or so, we have had an internet-based American Morse Telegraph Network. The free to download program, it's version 2.5 right here, uh, Morse KOB allows you to be a telegraph office on any one of a number of simulated wires. And they, and they work basically just like an old closed circuit system. From the main page, in addition to downloading the program, you can display all the currently active wires. All the ones in the 100 range are actual broadcasts, or most of them are broadcasts. It's a couple that are actually interactive. It allows you to, and they're different, different speeds, 20 words a minute, 35 words a minute. It, this is how you can practice on your, uh, your American Morse, brush up your speed. It also allows you to communicate with other like-minded individuals in a manner essentially identical with how it always was done on a classic railroad waywire. Here we have BBC World News at 20 words a minute. 